So we're back, we're ready to watercolor. We've stamped our designs on watercolor paper using permanent waterproof ink. And then I went ahead and heat set all of these stamped images for at least five seconds per image. And what I did is I pulled up a photograph of a sand dollar. And I'll, I'll proceed to do the same thing with the other seashells, but the sand dollar that I wanted to go for has this really pretty, purple tone to it. So I'm going to go ahead and paint that one first. Now obviously everybody's purple is going to be a little bit different. I'm using Daniel Smith watercolors and the two colors that I'm using are Rose of Ultramarine and Moon Glow. So I'm going to start with a wash a light wash, my, my brush is fully loaded with water. Lots and lots of water on there. And my objective is to have a nice wash of this really pretty kind of a uh, light magenta color. And that's the Rose of Ultramarine. Really the magic and the trick is Exactly as it sounds with watercolor, it's water. You have to have the right amount of water. You have to have the right amount of paint. And watercolor is always its prettiest when it's left translucent. If you get too much paint, you end up with a very opaque, almost chalky finish with watercolor. And there's nothing wrong with that if that's your goal. But it's just one of those things where it's kind of a fine line. Okay, so the entire thing is painted. The whole thing is still wet. I'm gonna come in with the same Rose of Ultramarine color, but this time I'm gonna do what's called a wet into wet technique. I'm just dropping in a little more of the concentrated Rose of Ultramarine color in and around. Think odd, odd numbers, right? We stamp in odd numbers, we decorate in odd numbers. It's the same thing with art. 
So I just went ahead and applied that in three different spots. Now I'm gonna go ahead and pick up Moon Glow. And most of you guys probably be like, what on earth is Moon Glow? It's a very specific Daniel Smith color that separates into like two or three different colors when it's dry. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous purple. And I'm gonna drop that Moon Glow in around the star shapes. I'm not fully painting in, I'm just kind of touching the tip of my brush in there to allow it to kind of like work in and flow. This part of my sand dollar is dry. So I'm gonna go ahead and drop in some concentrated Moon Glow, rinse my brush with a little bit of water, come in and kind of make the two edges kiss here. So I've got some sort of wet paint over here and now the Moon Glow is kind of flowing in and working in and around. I'll come over here, do the same thing. I don't wanna completely cover up the beautiful stamped image. The whole idea is that it's kind of our, our guide, right? We're using it to kind of show texture. We're using it to show the actual design. I'm rinsing my brush again and with water, I'm coming in and kind of softening the edges of where I laid that paint. I'll pick up some more Rose of Ultramarine. Drop that in. And I'm just gonna let that completely dry on its own, okay? Okay, so we're back to paint this one here. And you know, it's difficult to know exactly which of each of these seashells is or the colors that were originally inspired by it. But I'm gonna go off of this guy here. This is a Florida horse conch. And I'm just gonna go ahead and use kind of a combination of some light beigey yellow tones, maybe some pink and a little bit of brown. Luckily, the um, seashells brown portion, like the deepest areas are really stamped. So those are easily my darkest color. So I don't necessarily have to paint with any brown. So I'll just pick up some sort of a pink. And if you don't have pink, you can just use something as simple as like a, a rosy color. And then if you mix a little bit of a yellow ochre tone to it, it'll change it pretty dramatically. I'm using English Red Earth. That's again, it's another Daniel Smith color. So again, I'm gonna come in and kind of lightly add some of the pink. It's kind of every other. So we'll do a little bit of pink in the tip. Skip one, do a little more pink. I'm not even filling in edge to edge. So, you know, as we're kids, we kind of just colored the coloring book in from edge to edge and every little spot had its um, appropriate color. With watercolor, not so much. In fact, less in my opinion is more. I like a really loose technique and style. It's just my personal preference. But if you wanna to go to edge to edge, you can totally do that. So again, just dropping in some of that sweet, soft pink tone. I'll drop a little bit in around the edge here. Kinda of come down the side. I'm gonna rinse my brush, pick up some water, and just sort of gently help fill that in, but it's gonna be nice and soft. This is called softening my edge. Now I'm gonna pick up a little bit of a yellow ochre. Um, yellow ochre can quickly become very, very chalky. It's a bit more on the opaque side, so you wanna make sure that you have plenty of water in that. And I'm just gonna go ahead and drop in the yellow ochre in the every other section that wasn't already painted pink. You may be thinking, well, gosh, the pink is still wet. Why are you painting the yellow? Well, that, again, is just sort of how I paint my watercolor. I let the two kiss, and they basically create a lovely, soft, flowing effect within the two. So I'm pretty happy with that. I'm gonna go ahead and let that one dry, and we'll come back and do our third seashell. Okay, so for the third one, I'm gonna guess that it's like a scallop seashell. And this happens to have like some really pretty, almost purple magenta color in there. And down here, it gets a little bit more amber in color. So I'm just gonna go ahead and stick to that theme. We'll start first by simply putting water on our brush, okay? And I'm just going to do a nice wash of color in this first upper section of the seashell. So 
So again, this is just water. There's no paint on my brush yet. And this is a wet technique. So when we were painting the others, the paper was dry, so it was dry. And then now we're doing a wet technique. So now what happens when we pick up a little bit of color is that paint is going to flow very differently. So I'm just going to drop in, kind of in the arc of the seashell, a little of that really flashy, beautiful color. And then if I go ahead and do the same thing on the next row, the color is super, super light and kind of flows more organically. If you're wondering what that color is, that is um, Bordeaux, another Daniel Smith color, but you could just use something that's like a little bit of red mixed with a little bit of purple. Um, if it ends up being a little bit too plummy, you can always add just a little bit more red and it becomes a bit more magenta. Now for down here, we're going to do a very similar situation with water first. And then I'm gonna pick up a little bit of this orange color. It's called Quinn Deep Gold. That's a short abbreviated term for it. The full name is Quinacridone Deep Gold. And just to see, yep, up here at the tips of my seashell are pretty dry. So I'm gonna drop in a little bit of that Quinn Deep Gold just because I think it's interesting and the contrast is pretty. I rinsed my brush and now I'm softening my edges with a little bit of water. Drop in a little more concentrated Quin Deep Gold. Leaving little bits of white. Your eye is naturally drawn to the white areas. You don't have to cover everything up. I'm dropping in a little more water in here. And again, just a smidge more of the Quinn Deep Gold. I like that so much that I'll do a little bit on the left side as well. Okay, so again, less is more with this technique. So I'm gonna go ahead and freeze, dry this completely with my heat tool, and then I'll come back for the final technique. Okay, so one of the things I didn't mention is that key to using a heat tool and not burning your paper is making sure that you have a fist width away from your paper. So as you're drying, you're keeping your heat tool at least a fist width away. Now, if your paper curls up on you and the edges start curling up a lot, if you flip this guy over and you hit set it with your heat tool for just a few seconds, it'll actually flatten back down for you. Kind of a helpful little trick. All right. So now what we're going to do is a combination of splatter. Okay. I like to splatter with a nice brown color. It's a bit more on the antique -y side. And if you find something that's like a vintage um, scientific layout where you've got like specimen one, specimen two, you find that there's often an aging to the paper. So what I'm gonna do is take a little of this brown, make sure that I have a decent amount of water and a decent amount of paint. Again, it's just kind of finding the sweet spot. And I'm going to splat my brush and create some wonderful age spots to this. 
Then what I'm gonna do is rinse my brush and I'm gonna come back in and splat in the same areas, but with water. So it's going to hit some of the areas that had previously been splat with brown and some not. This is gonna be called scumbling. So you're gonna come in and you're going to just gently kind of stir some of those little brown spots around. And you're basically just adding these great little age spots to your project. If I splat again, especially on areas where there's concentrated pockets of water, again, it just makes it look even older. So I'm gonna scumble a bit more here. And by scumbling, I'm just adding a little bit of water on my brush to some of these edges that have had little brown splats of paint. A little more brown splatter, a little more water on my brush, kind of just dancing around, moving some of those splatter spots to loosen them up. And I'm gonna go ahead and let that dry. So I can already tell as my painting is drying that some of the areas have flattened out a little bit. And by that, I mean they feel like they've not become um, so 3D anymore. So just by adding an additional layer of color to a few areas, you can change that. So I'm just gonna add a little bit more of my pinky color here. This was my English Red Earth. And I'll also add a little bit more of my yellow ochre in a couple of spots. And that will help make my seashell feel a little less flat. Same thing with the sand dollar. I'll come in with my moon glow, kind of cast some shadows underneath some of these little star areas. Just a few touches here and there, and it changes just a smidge. You can soften the edges with some water a little bit if they're a little too hard. And then all of a sudden your sand dollar looks like it's kind of popping off the page at you. So go ahead and speed that up again in the drying. So at this point, if you wanted to, you could write down what they were. Um, I tend to not write them down, but for just for the heck of it, we'll do it this time. I want to make sure I get the spelling right. So um, this is a, a permanent fountain pen, basically, and it comes with um, an ink cartridge in it when you first buy it. It's called platinum, and it's a carbon ink, which means once it's dry, it's waterproof, and it gives you that really awesome fountain pen effect when you're writing. So make sure before you write on your card that you actually kind of practice and kind of get a hang of how the pen works. So I'll just come in here and do scallop with one P and then we have our sand dollar I don't know if there's an actual name specific to the little purple sand dollar so 
I'm just gonna double check that. Always easy to find that type of stuff online. I'm gonna type purple sand dollar. And fascinating facts about sand dollars. My guess is that when they're still alive, they're these really beautiful colors. So we're just gonna go ahead and pop down sand dollar. And for consistency, let's do it just below it. And then our other seashell. That was the Florida horse conch. So we'll just call that a conch shell. Okay, and that is ready for our next step. Okay, so we have our frame with um, all of the really beautiful impressions and stamps of the different seashells and I've got a few seahorses and a lot of coral in there. It's all dried. I let that just dry out in the sun and I think maybe 20, 30 minutes and it was good. So my next step is to whitewash the frame. Now the, the thing is, you've got all of this wonderful detail that's been pressed into the Venetian plaster. But what you don't want to do is fill up all of those details with too much thick chalk paint. So especially important is to water down whatever chalk paint you're using, and it could be any color. I mean, imagine how pretty like a seafoam green or um, a robin's egg blue would look on this. I'm just going with a nice neutral because I think it's actually, um, it would appeal to a larger audience. And then also because my um, seashell watercolor painting is so beautiful and vibrant and I want that to kind of speak for itself as well. So again, as I'm going, I'm just doing a really light wash of the um, watered down chalk paint. And I'm gonna paint the entire frame, but right now I wanna be able to focus on the watered down version of this chalk paint. And then we'll dry this up and we'll work on the rest of it when we're done. I used Venetian plaster for my texture medium, but there are so many texture mediums. You can use modeling paste, texture paste, um, Liquitex, Golden, Finnabar. There are so many different brands out there of any kind of a texture medium. The Venetian plaster just happens to be my favorite because I buy the pint of it and it lasts me forever. And um, the other thing too is that it doesn't have like a funky color to it. It's just like your normal putty. It doesn't dry, um, dry a different color. Okay, so let's go ahead and dry this up and then I will whitewash the rest of the wood. Alrighty, so I'm back and I'm gonna go ahead and whitewash the rest of this, kind of just diluting my chalk paint as I go. And as with any whitewash, you kind of want to paint a small space and then wipe away so that it's got a little bit of your wood grain texture showing and it doesn't look too intentional. I mean, obviously the whole beachy effect is very, very, uh, it's really normal to see a lot of whitewashing and that sort of thing. And you don't necessarily have to paint all of this base in here because we're gonna be covering that with our picture. And you can repeat as much or as little as you want so that you get your desired finish. And then 
I'll repeat the rest with the sides. And I'm doing my best to hold the insides and the outside of the frame and not the actual Venetian plaster, just in case any of that is still wet. You don't want to accidentally smash all that detail. We'll go ahead and dry that up with our heat tool again. Okay, so my piece is completely dry and I'm gonna come in and antique, but I'm gonna antique with a kind of a rusty brown color. This is called Quinacridone Nickel Azo Gold. It's a golden fluid acrylic. I'm gonna go ahead and just drop a tiny amount out. That's probably when it's all flat about the size of a dime, no more than that. And I'm going to mix water in with that. This is highly concentrated acrylic paint. You don't have to have a lot. And again, I'm gonna paint in sections. So this is just a little bit on top of one area and gently blot. Now, if you wanted to completely skip this step altogether, you totally could. It's just, again, one way for me to tie in the color of the watercolor and also give some fun contrast and aging to the frame itself. And you can see that that tiny, tiny amount of paint covered the entire face of the frame and I can even kind of go in and dry brush stroke some of that extra on my brush on the inside or the outside if I want to all that wonderful detail is pressed into the plaster medium We're gonna come back in with the same cream colored chalk paint. Just a little bit of water added to that. Start in small sections. Using your finger, kind of take and rub 
that cream colored paint in and around. The objective is to not completely cover up all of the aged color. It's just to kind of give a peekaboo of color underneath but not have it overpower the entire thing. All right, go ahead and dry that up and we'll be back. Okay, so I did half of the frame to kind of give you an idea of what I'm going for. I've come back in with the same ink that I stamped my watercolor images with earlier, okay? And what I'm doing is I'm very carefully dabbing my finger onto the pad and kind of softly glazing my finger over any and all of the texture. Some of the texture will be just when you palette knifed the plaster down, and some will be when you pressed all of the seashells into the actual texture. So again, I'm just going over this really, really softly, kind of pouncing back onto the pad periodically to lift more ink. You have to do this really softly. Otherwise, you end up really smushing in too much color and you're getting underneath. You just want this to be on all of the raised texture of the frame. Okay, so now I'm done. I've gone all the way around. I'm just gonna pick up a sponge, a makeup brush. If you happen to have one of the Tim Holtz craft sponges or any of the craft sponges really for that matter, you can kind of ink up the edge and I'm basically just rubbing the sponge on the corner of my frame just to give the darker edge an antiquing finish to the frame itself. As much antiquing or as little as you'd like, it really is completely up to you. So there is my frame. And then when I pop my watercolor image in there, you can see it's completely, like all the focus is on the watercolor, but you're like, wait a minute, what's going on with that frame? Is there texture on that? And yes, yes, there is. So we'll go ahead and mount this into our frame in just a sec, and I'll be right back. All right, so all I did was put a little bit of foam tape on the back of the watercolor paper, and that's just regular old foam tape, nothing special. As you're pressing down, just try to remember that your foam tape is in the top. A strip down the center so that you don't accidentally press too hard. And also make sure that your image or your um, detailing is in the direction that you want it to go in as well. 
So I'm just going to drop that in. Before I press down, I'm going to give it a little scooch to center it a bit. That foam tape is already sticking. Okay, give it a press. And then you have your little watercolor and uh, mixed media plaster frame. All right, thanks for joining me guys. Hope you have a good one, bye.